Over the course of this series, you found out that you're no different from an animal because you actually are an animal. You've learned what it means to be a chordate and a vertebrate and also a mammal and what sort of mammal you are. You faced the possibly disturbing fact that you're a primate and even the potentially insulting fact that humans are quite literally a bunch of monkeys. There are still one or two more uncomfortable truths like that coming up in this series, but you're over the worst of it. We've also been following the course of our evolution through geologic history. And for most of that time, we've only been looking at the one lineage of our ancestors to survive the next extinction at the end of every epoch, until we got to the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction beginning the Cenozoic era that we're in now. Because I thought it helpful to show where some of our familiar fauna came from. Except for American opossums and some uniquely Australian paleofauna that I'll cover in another episode, all mammals that are still alive today are eutherians, meaning placental mammals. And starting there, we followed our own lineage from eutheria to boreo-eutheria to uarchontoglyars, which includes rodents and, of course, primates. But we've also been looking at a sister group, Laurasiotheria, with ungulates that we talked about last time and carnivorans that we'll talk about next time. But this time, we're looking at a more distant cousin group, Atlanta genata. On one side are sloths and armadillos, and on the other is the side topic of today's lecture. Elephants and manatees. Elephants belong to the family Proboscidea, which includes more than just elephants, and manatees belong to the family Serenia, which includes more than just manatees. There were already a handful of different mammalian groups that had diversified prior to and somehow lived through the KT extinction that killed three quarters of all living species, including all of the dinosaurs, except for the birds. But at that time, that critical dividing line in paleohistory, the ancestors of elephants and the ancestors of manatees was the same animal. This is according to both morphology of transitional fossils and a recent study of the largest available molecular data set for placental mammals, which includes segments of 19 nuclear and three mitochondrial genes from representatives of all extant placental orders. Afrotheria doesn't have any elephant birds, elephant seals, or even elephant Gerald. But it does include elephant shrews, along with manatees, tenrecs, aardvarks, hyrax, dugongs, dassies, and other silly sounding words. The first Afrotherian didn't look much like an elephant. It looked more like an elephant shrew, because elephant shrews are the most basal karyotypic species of this clade. The shrew, the mole, and the aardvark are all in a subclade called Afroinsectophilia, meaning that they both figuratively and literally dig bugs. We're looking at the sister clade, Panungulata. This is the side that has hooves although the claws of aardvarks are really flattened nails that are intermediate to hooves. The most basal member of Penungulata that is still alive today are just a few species of hyrax, which is also intermediate in that it has hoof-like claws. Molecular analysis shows that penungulates appeared by at least 54 to 60 million years ago in the Paleocene, but the earliest hyracoid fossil we found so far is Dimeotherium from 37 million years ago in the Eocene. The next subset is Tethytheria, and this is where they start getting bigger. Besides Proboscidea and Serenia, there is also an extinct group called Emberthipoda. There are a few species in this group, but they're best represented by Arsinotherium. This is not a rhino, although it does look superficially rhino-like. Having two horns, it's a bit like its contemporary, Brontotherium. In the Oligocene and Miocene periods, having double nose horns was quite the fashion trend. We see them not only on elephant relatives and on horse relatives, but also on rodents, as well as armadillos, and even dinosauronid ungulates like the enormous and hideous Wintotherium, looking like a giant rhino-buffalo-warthog combo. But it wasn't any of those things. It had five toes and saber teeth, because reasons, and it was otherwise very different from any ungulate you've ever seen. And it wasn't an afrotheer, either. The next subset of Tethytheres takes us to the point where proboscideans and serenians diverge in the late Paleocene, soon after the superorder began. The oldest proboscidean fossils we have are jaw fragments from Phosphotherium roughly 56 million years ago. Likewise, the oldest serenian fossils we have are those of Pezosiren portelli from 50 million years ago. Pezosiren wasn't a modern manatee or dugong or sea cow, which were as big as whales. Europeans discovered Stellar's sea cow around some islands in the Bering Sea in 1741 and hunted them to extinction in less than 30 years. Just like whales, modern manatees have tiny vestigial remnants of their hind legs concealed within their bodies. Some older serenians, known only from fossils, like Eutheroides, had hind limbs long enough to be seen as a superfluous second pair of flippers protruding outside of their blubber. Pezosiren was a manatee in every sense other than that it had four fully functional legs with feet instead of flippers. 
Daryl Domning, the paleontologist who discovered Pesosaurin in 2001, said, this is the most primitive form found so far. We found others with legs that couldn't support its weight, but this is the first whole skeleton with legs that could support the animal out of water, yet it has clear adaptations for aquatic life. We essentially have every stage now from a terrestrial animal to one that is fully aquatic. We don't know what that first proboscidean looked like. Looking at the teeth and jaws, we can tell that it was relative to elephants, but not elephant-sized. It was only about 30 centimeters high, so it wouldn't look much like an elephant. We don't know what it looked like. For that, we have to look at a more recent skeleton of a later proboscidean, Moeritherium from the late Eocene. It didn't look like an elephant either, but it did look a lot like Pezosiren, not just superficially, but fundamentally. One of the laws of evolution is that the further back in time you look, the more similar organisms appear to be because they're more closely related. This is an illustration of that. These two vastly different lineages came from the same source, one that didn't look like either of them turned out to be, way back in the Paleocene. Since then, the proboscideans developed having to build on and adapt to a number of interesting defects. Elephants started out as relatively small tapir-like things until their teeth went crazy and started growing out of control. This is true of the whole order. That's the nature of inherited traits. Consequently, proboscideans are recognized and categorized not by their prehensile noses, but by their outrageous dentistry. They may have grown a short trunk like a tapir has, but their incisors, which were pointed and fang-like, not bladed like ours, grew so long that the nose kind of had to grow out along with them. The Oligocene semi-elephant called Pheomia is beginning to look the part and shows us just how these teeth started growing a lot longer than they should have been. This gomphotherium from 20 million years ago represents a point in elephant evolution when the upper and lower incisors grew to such proportions that they were unusable for eating, and of course the length of the nose had to increase right along with the teeth and lower jaw. This led to tetralophodon, trilophodon, paleomastodon, and platybelodon. The next really important stage of elephant evolution is when the lower incisors became tusks. Now some of these species didn't have such shovel-like teeth anymore, and there was a space left where the newly lengthened nose could slide between, so that now it would be considered a true trunk, as seen here on Stegotetrabelodon. Obviously, there was a point where these absurdly mutated teeth had become useless for eating, which forced the animal to use their already flexible noses to rake and trowel food into their mouths the same way that modern elephants still do today. Initially, both the top and bottom incisors grew out as well as the lower jaw. And Dinotherium represents the point in which this trend came to an end, when the lower jaw sort of dropped off, so to speak, leaving one now very long nose, which was out there by itself, as it is on modern elephants. Just a couple million years ago, every species that bore four tusks and elongated lower jaws eventually died out, leaving Dinotheres and the more familiar-looking twin-tusked proboscideans like Stegodont, which led to woolly mammoths, and the gigantic Columbian mammoth, as well as Mastodons, which were very different from mammoths or elephants, of which we only have three species still around. Now, let's turn away from Afrotherians and get back to our own lineage. At this point in our series, we're looking back at the Middle Eocene period, roughly 30 million years ago. To recap, we saw how we're primates, specifically drynos or haploid. We saw that we're also monkeys or anthropoid simiaforms, and specifically old world monkeys or catarines. Now we're going to talk about the next important subset of that sequence. Catarine, the clade of old world monkeys, consists of two extant groups, hominoidia and cercopithecoidea. All extant old world monkeys that people typically comfortably recognize as monkeys are cercopiths, not to be confused with hominoidia, which is the superfamily of apes. Apes are traditionally distinguished from and not considered to be monkeys because some people think that all old world monkeys are cercopiths, which is a sister group. But there is another older group that is possibly paraphyletic, but still basal to both hominoids and cercopithecoids, and that is Propliopithecoidea, which didn't yet share all of the traits of modern cercopiths that distinguish them from modern apes. The most famous Propliopithecoid species is Egyptopithecus, which has been described by paleoprimatologists as an ape-like monkey. Its name loosely means an Egyptian link to the apes because it has shared traits with intermediate apes. For example, if we jump up to the Middle Eocene, another 13 million years or so closer to our time, we see Proconsul, a genus of just a handful of species from Eastern Africa that have been described by leading paleoprimatologists as a monkey-like ape. Proconsul was tailless. That alone doesn't meet the criteria. There are macaques living in Gibraltar that don't have tails either. They're called Barbary apes, but everyone knows that they're not really apes. They're, there are more requirements to be an ape than just being a monkey with no tail. 
Apes have a broader chest and even less olfactory capacity or ability to scent than other monkeys, leading to an even shorter snout or shorter face. And their dentition shows traits unique to that clade too. They also have a greater tendency toward bipedality, and some species, apart from humans, are exclusively bipedal, at least on the ground. One commonality that they all have, which they all share with most monkeys, are their ears. Nothing else in the animal kingdom has ears like the ones that we share with every other ape and most other monkeys. Another trait that is distinctly ape is that they're all capable of brachiation, hanging or swinging from the arms due to greatly increased occipital arc or shoulder rotation, which other monkeys don't have and can't do or can't do nearly as well. This could be the one trait that Proconsul doesn't have because transitional species don't usually adopt every definitive trait at once as we've seen throughout this series plenty of times already. Like all transitional species, Proconsul had a mixture of traits inherited from the parent clade as well as a portion of definitive traits to be passed down to the daughter groups. As such, Proconsul rides the line and maybe crosses into the root or crown, the dawn or progenitor of superfamily hominoidea. And of course, there are a host of other transitional intermediates who take over from there, and we'll talk about those next time. When you think of apes, most people think of the big ones, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, but remember that none of those were around 23 million years ago, nor was there yet anything remotely like them. And remember that everything that is big started out small. So when you look back at the dawn of apes, if you want to see a living ape that is karyotypic or representative of what those early apes looked like, take a look at the taxonomic family Hylobatidae, also known as the lesser apes. This is a family of gibbons and siamangs. These are technically apes, but they're much smaller and look more like monkeys. The fossil record of early apes looks a lot more like gibbons than chimpanzees and the like. In fact, some of the early fossil apes look more like monkeys than modern gibbons do because they were still in transition. The word hominoid means humanoid, encompassing humans and other human-like categories, which colloquially means apes. We are undeniably part of that group. Monkeys are pretty smart as animals go, but apes are the smartest, having an even larger average brain size to body mass than other monkeys do. Apes are able to understand quite a lot, and our species is the smartest of the apes, so you ought to be able to figure this out. The man who invented taxonomy, Carl Linn, also known as Carolus Linnaeus, lived a century before Darwin, and he had no idea that new species could evolve. He didn't know that that was even a possibility. So he was quite confused when he compared humans to the other apes. He classified humans as apes and apes as humans because he literally couldn't tell them apart. And he famously issued a challenge to the scientific community of his day, which has still never been met. I demand of you and of the whole world that you show me a generic character, one that is according to the generally accepted principles of classification, by which to distinguish between man and ape. I myself most assuredly know of none. I wish someone would indicate one to me. But if I had called a man an ape or vice versa, I would have fallen under the bed of all ecclesiastics. It may be that as a naturalist, I ought to have done so. And indeed he did. Later on, the whole science of paleontology was discovered, which ultimately aligned with new revelations in genetics to prove that Linnaeus was right, that humans literally are apes. And we own and control this world, so you know what that makes this? You can either accept it like a rational person, or you can reject it and get outraged and throw an emotional temper tantrum about it, but you'll only prove the point when we see you go ape.